Hi, I'm Dr. Kathy Fields. I am in private practice here in San Francisco. I'm co-inventor, co-creator of Proactive Solution and Rodan and Fields Skin Care. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Kathy Fields, a Stanford-trained, board-certified dermatologist who has been in private practice in San Francisco since 1987. She's an adjacent assistant clinical professor of dermatology at Stanford and an assistant clinical professor of dermatology at UCSF. Dr. Kathy Fields and Dr. Katie Rodan co-founded Proactive Solution in 1995, a paradigm shift in the treatment of acne, helping millions worldwide. The doctors are also the co-founders of Rodan and Fields, the number one premium skincare brand in North America, focused on life-changing skincare available through a platform of consumer-connected commerce. Dr. Fields and Dr. Rodan are considered America's richest self-made beautypreneurs. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Kathy Fields, co-founder and co-creator of Rodan and Fields and Proactive Solutions. Doc, how are we doing today? Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. So let's get this conversation started. You know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency? Well, I came out of residency at Stanford University. So my med school was University of Miami, came out to Stanford in dermatology, and I wanted to be the best cosmetic surgeon. And at that time, there was the premier group in San Francisco, which was Ted Tromovich and Sam Stegman, both passed away from one from a suicide and the other from HIV. This is now the early 90s, but it was a pivotal time and we were breaking through dermatology went from syphilis and acne to now the cosmetic world. So this is the very earliest time for collagen fillers were just beginning. And I knew that my interest would be in this arena. So kind of taking us through that chief year of your residency, what was your mentality getting into your first job search and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Okay, so I, wanted to stay in the Bay Area. Again, being uh, most of my family was in Miami, I made the decision one, stay in San Francisco. Number two, I wanted a surgical uh, employment and I wanted to join a group. I wasn't ready being single to to stop and, and plant roots. I wanted to try out a group practice first. And as it turned out, the most prestigious group in the country in that era was again, uh, the Stegman and Tromovich group who wrote the book on cosmetic dermatology. And it was my chair of my program who recommended me uh, for the spot because unfortunately Sam Stegman was ill with HIV. So it's the end of the eighties, just before 90. So uh, I joined that group and it was an amazing learning experience. It was the right thing at the time. And in my era, you could go to a tower like Kaiser and be an employee of a big wheel That was 20% of germs. 80% either joined a group or went solo in 1987, 1990. So for me, this was the most amazing opportunity. And in in a sense, it was a fellowship. We were doing the very beginnings of liposuction, which was not done in the late 80s, 90s with Fournier. So this was a mind blowing opportunity, but they both died shortly after. By 90, uh, spring of 90, both of these, icons in dermatology had passed away and our group had to reform. Now, when you're going through that job process and through the interview market, were you always considered to go private practice or did you ever consider going academic? I never considered academic. It's usually a bloodbath in the academic arena and it's a very different mindset and um, opportunity and problem. There's great satisfaction in publishing papers and getting your research in and having your teams and the panache of academic titles. I'm adjunct professor at UCSF and at Stanford for the last 25, 30 years, Um, but I'm on the outsides as adjunct faculty, which is a perfect place to be. In the tower is a very different animal. I always wanted to, as my dad said, be my own boss. And what that means is I'm in control of my destiny. In dermatology, we can do that. I decide what time I wanna start and finish my day, how many patients I wanna put into my practice. Um, I can decide how much I wanna make, how much time I wanna take off. I can hire who I want and who can be on my team. And that's a very different position from an employee of a tower, whether academic or in these new institutional towers. Now, before we get into the empires that you've built, 
Can you kind of talk to us about what do you think were some of the keys to your success in your early career that allowed you to be successful? Well, in my early career, I learned from all of my mentors. It's important to see several different kinds of practice, try them on, see what you like and what you don't like and where the friction is and where you decide I can tolerate that much friction or I can't. Example, if you are owning and working your own private practice, all the responsibility is on you. All the overhead, the hiring, the firing, all the insurance changes, that is your problem. But if you're in a group and you've abdicated all of those things, now you're at the whim of those who control. And that's going to bother you. It depends on your personality um, and the timing in your life, if you have kids or not, or whatever your other ambitions are. Uh, you give away a lot of your choice and freedom. So they both have pros and cons. But how that works out really depends also on if you're married or not and your, your own abilities. Some people are born to lead and others are real happy to let someone else do it, stay home, hang out with the kids three days a week. Now, as arguably one of the most successful dermatologists in the world, you know, what would you say was the fundamental mindset or mind shift from going from the private practice route to creating your, your own empires and being an entrepreneur? All right. So first of all, Katie and I met at Stanford. Katie Rodan and I graduated in 87. And the first advice we got from our chairman as we graduated, he said, find a hobby. Be the best. Be an expert in something or you'll be doomed to treating acne and warts. So we became the queens of acne. Why? Acne is a four letter word and it's all about self-esteem. We immediately knew that the most important real estate you will ever own is right here. This is it, this is who you are, this is what you show to the world. And if this isn't working for whatever reason, particularly starting with acne, because you're judged by that problem, it stops you from getting a job, maybe even going to school, finding the right spouse, all your dreams and aspirations won't come true when you're locked into your own skin. So early on, we started our invention of proactive. Now we never sought to be rich. This was about fixing a need. And ironically, big business didn't care. Big pharma was not interested in the little market of acne. So we said, if we don't help people who can't get access to us. This was the new era of HMO and PPO where you had to have a piece of paper. So if there was no access, people will scar. And a scar is forever. I have 14 devices that I use in my office. Even with my best devices and fillers, scars are forever. So Katie and I in, in the early 90s were compelled to find an answer. What hubris that <laughs> we thought we could do better, but we did. We invented a paradigm shift in the treatment of acne. And so what that was, was three medicines, not one, not spot treat, but like dentists, you brush every day and prevent tooth decay, treat every day with three medicines in your daily skincare and prevent acne breakouts. We were right, really right. It's now, it has been a billion dollar company and we're not business people. We ended up uh, doing a royalty uh, agreement with Guthy Ranker in LA where you are. Um, and a, a lot of serendipity went into how that whole thing happened, but we never gave up our day jobs. Katie and I still practice to this day um, because we have our hands wet. We're always with our patients. We understand what the needs are right now. And that makes us better when we go to our boardrooms or our research and development teams for our next step, our next technology. So we still love what we do. We still love firsthand one-on-one -on -one healthcare. Now, I've got a two-pronged question to follow up on that is one, you know, being a female in this space at that time, there must have been a lot of obstacles you had to overcome. And additionally, how are you able to balance your, your private practice plus building your company plus your family life aspect as well? It's a good question. Um, you know, I often lecture and I don't lecture to just women entrepreneurs, though I'm often billed as that lead speaker to women. I think guys are great. And I think you deserve a seat at the table when we do these discussions. Right now in residency in dermatology, it's over 50% women. So we're not missing out on anything and opportunity wise. Uh, we've certainly saturated medicine. 
So, you know, guys are, are welcome to the discussion. We all have responsibility. So no complaining there, number one. Number two, family matters. In my specialty, we can have it all. We can uh, raise kids, make babies, uh, and be able to work our day jobs and get great satisfaction. And we don't have call. We're not obligated to the hospital. Um, and we don't have to be beholden to the insurance companies. My practice is an all cash practice, for example. That's a miracle in today's world. So that, that's a real sense of freedom. And therefore, for a woman, what she needs is help. Simple as that. Example, when things really got rolling and I had my day job, my proactive, my husband and little kids, um, I delegated. I hate carpool. Can't do it. Don't ask me to do it because if it's 7.05 and I got to get two kids out in the car, pick up another kid and get to school, I will have a nervous breakdown and the kids could die because I screamed at them. <laughs> so I have help. <laughs> and that's how you get through the many, many stresses. A great spouse and maybe a nanny, and you can balance and have it all and be a very kind and wonderfully nurturing parent through all of it. Now, your journey is so unique with the amount of success that you've seen across the world. You know, what would you say were some of the key moments throughout your journey that really you sit back and thought, wow, because I made that decision, I was able to do this? Well, you know, life, life, I don't know what's happening ahead, but I know when your vision is there, when you can really see what you want it to be, the path is unknown, but if you're focused on that vision, you will find your way. So the first problem when someone comes out of residency for myself too, I didn't know where I wanted to land. So First is to try everything on, the group practice, the solo, the, you know, get mentored, find people who are happy doing what they're doing and discover why. So there wasn't, there wasn't an epiphany along the way. It was being open to, to seeing what was available, learning from people around me. Just trying to think if there was any sort of big, big moment. I think the, the first big one, is I was in that group, this amazingly advanced, you know, challenging, interesting group in dermatology. And then everyone died and we reorganized and it was not the same, but I was there a long time from about 88 until 96. And then proactive really started to shoot up and it was time for me to leave the group. And I was afraid. I thought, well, you know, should I go solo? Now I have small, really small babies. I was pregnant at the time with number two, uh, but it was my husband who said, do it the way you mean to carry on. And he had my back. I had a safety net because we had in San Francisco, you need two incomes, even though practice was just starting, we needed two. <laughs> so having a safety net is a blessing and gave me the courage to go out on my own, sign the lease, invest in and create my own practice. So that, that if you can find the right partner in life to help you through your journey, things will go your way. And the corollary is also true. The wrong partner, nothing happens. All your best dreams are, are over uh, essentially. So fight hard for that relationship. It matters um, for everything you do. Now, through all your experience, through your different journeys and your different career paths, now that you actually speak and teach resident, uh, at the residency program at UCSF and Stanford, you know, what type of advice do you have for the graduating chief residency fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? But that's an interesting question because they, when you're in practice, you think your value is very high, really high, stupid high because they do not run a practice. They've never been paid, they're, you know, they're salaried and they don't understand the billing, you're in the towers, the empires. You get out thinking that you're worth lots of money and you're not. That's why you need to really look into practices and see how you are paid and what you are worth. And so I, I also find that besides thinking they're worth a fortune, they don't want to work. Um, none of us who are my age, I'm 62, 
got there because you know somebody paid me a nice fat check and I stayed home. I killed myself. We worked hard, lots and lots of patients, meeting other doctors, working on referrals. People need to know that's what you have to do unless you're an employee of a tower. Now, I prefer to network, grow my practice, have relationships with my patients. And I really have wonderful relationships. It is satisfying. So my journey was hard. It was well worth it. But I came down to reality when you understand overhead and you understand insurance and billing and your real value. That somehow residents don't get that. Uh, and they will learn the hard way. And a point that we discussed is you're expendable. You may think you are the best surgeon on the planet, but nobody cares except your mother. And so if that's the case, how do you prove that? How do you have the value that is valued by others? And that's also a learning curve and that's being there on call, available, uh, and ready to work and do the right thing so that you get the respect that you feel you should have. It takes work. Now you bring up a very interesting point as far as being able to network. Now mm -hmm. with the issue right now with the pandemic, you know, a lot of these conferences have been done online. So what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process when they don't have the ability to meet folks like yourself at conferences? Uh, networking is, is key for certainly to try on different practice opportunities. And there really isn't a replacement. Meeting through a computer screen is not it at all. And quite honestly, teledermatology, which my colleagues down at Stanford are doing, I don't know how that can work because our sport is very touchy feely. I mean, uh, you could show me there's a bump on your forehead, but until I can really palpate it, I'm, there's just no way. Uh, you really have to be immersed in it. So in the short term, I would suggest the residents look at the opportunities and interview the colleagues who are also doing the same thing. Talk to everybody. A big mistake is assuming it's okay and just jumping in or signing a contract that you're beholden to and you realize you've made a big mistake. So the more talking you do, the more you'll learn. Uh, I think non-competes are legal and not legal in different states. And that's why these contracts matter. So do consider getting an attorney before you ink pieces of paper, because you may really hurt yourself and not have a clue what you just walked into. So do not trust that someone has the fiduciary responsibility to look out for you. They do not. So make sure you have an attorney that you trust to really look at agreements before you sign anything. Now, I know that before we got the interview started, we were talking about the value that physicians feel going into the market for the first time, burnout rates and all those things. What would be one piece of advice you have for young physicians entering the real world? <sighs> Gosh, one, there's not one. It's like a list of, of, of um, opportunities. When, again, if you know what you're walking into and you have realistic expectations, the goal is to do what you need to do and then excel at it. Really be responsible to your patients and what you're doing and your teams and be that person uh, that everyone likes to be around, that everybody is uplifted when you're in the room because you're doing the right things. And when that happens, you're in flow. We all remember flow in residency. It's three in the morning, you're doing that great surgery, you're, you're saving someone's life. It's a high five everywhere. <sighs> Private practice doesn't work like that, unfortunately. The knives are out, there's backstabbing, it's difficult. So to avoid burnout, you have to put yourself in a situation where you're doing your best work and you're being appreciated for it. Just like a relationship. If you're not getting what you want, it will not change. If you think it's going to get better, it won't. And this is where you got to listen to yourself and move on. A lot of people wake up five years, 10 years later and go, what was I thinking? I was never happy. So just like in a relationship, in, a, in your work life, you'll know real fast if it's a great fit and it's working for you or not. 
get out sooner than later. Don't invest a lot of time trying to change or fix a broken system. They're too big now to fix. Like the first question I get from doctors, which makes me laugh is, why aren't you retired? Retired? You've got to be kidding me. This is so much fun. Being able to help people, you know, one at a time is a gift and should be celebrated. And I treasure it. And even in the heat of COVID, I was working every day. You should see my mask. In fact, it's right over here. I got to show you. It's really cool. It's uh, totally encapsulated. But the point being, when you love what you do, that's what you do forever. Now, entrepreneurs see a problem and don't just talk about it. They fix it. And you, when you really understand your patients, you understand what they're doing and what they're not doing. And this is your opportunity. And the opportunity is vast. Look around you. When I walk into the practice, I can think of 50 things I could fix. Some of them are big business ideas. Some of them are technological breakthroughs. And some of them are just for me. But when you get an idea that you think is important, you won't sleep. It will keep you going. Um, all the way to see it through, that's when you know you have something really special that is worth bringing to the world. Now, I don't know, it's common for people to say, gee, I could have thought of proactive solution, the acne system. And my answer is, well, why didn't you? And why didn't you bring it to the market? Because it's an idea and people give up. So for the entrepreneurs out there, I bet you have wonderful ideas. Get a mentor. Talk to everyone in the tech space, the medical space, health industry, big pharma, whatever it is you think you've got that's important to deliver to the world, don't give up on it. Find someone to help you on your path. So that would be a mentor, then becomes a cheerleader, and then support. For your next lecture, we can talk about how Katie and I did it all on our own financially. We didn't get seed money, angel money, investors A, B, and C, niente, nada. Take it as far as you can before the sharks come in and try to steal your idea and push you to the bottom of the ocean. But that's for another lecture. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.